All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started um, real quick. So I'm going to get the sign-in sheet passed around. And then um, one thing I forgot I was going to have set up here, but I kind of forgot about it. Um, I told you all that I would give you all a copy of our schedule for the next couple days or couple weeks so that you all had this. I think that's enough for you all. Anybody who's missing it, come up here and grab it. All right, so let's go through and just recap where we were going with this example. I told you all that this would be a, uh, uh, a really big uh, example and that um, we would spend some time discussing this. Now, I'll be frank, I, I, I didn't get a chance to put together my little Excel sheet showing you all some sensitivity of some of this. So I might, we might look at that at the beginning of next lecture. But what I want to do is show you all how some of these parameters actually really do affect the design uh, of our cross section. Uh, in other words, like if I made FC prime 3 KSI as opposed to 4 KSI, how does it really affect our problem from start to finish? If I change FY, how does that matter? <coughs> but for purposes of what we're doing today, it really isn't going to affect us. Today, I just want to continue on with our design example. So if you remember, we had a beam that's 22 feet long. We need to resist a dead load of one kip per foot, a live load of two kips per foot. Uh, the one kip per foot is in addition to the beam self-weight. So we had to make an assumption what the beam looked like at the very beginning so that we could compute beam self-weights. The, the live load's already reduced, so we ain't got to worry about any of that. We need to size and, and, and select reinforcement of this beam from start to finish. Okay. So. We did a lot of this work last time, so a lot of this we don't have to go through in very significant detail, but I at least want to recap and make sure everybody's on the same page. So here's what we did, uh, and I'll walk through it, so uh, listed our beam parameters. Now, one, the reason why I'm walking through this is because I want to make some observations about what we assumed, okay? so that we, we realize that we have to go back and verify our assumptions. Now, one of those assumptions was the self-weight of the beam. We didn't have a clue what the beam looked like at the very beginning, so we had to make an assumption about its width and its height. Okay? Now, we're saying that the beam is about 8 inches wide by about 16 and a half inches deep. Was the final or our trial section, what, did it end up being bigger or smaller? A lot bigger. So that's going to change our weight, so it's going to change our moments on that. So that's where some of this iteration might come into play. Hopefully, we won't need to, but it's just something worth mentioning. So we assumed a beam self-weight. We also assumed a feed value of 0.9. Now, using that beam self-weight, we were able to compute a factored distributed load and ultimately a factored moment on the section. And from that factored moment, we could uh, go into design. We assumed a fee value of 0.9. More than likely, that assumption is going to hold true. But just in case, we need to go through and verify that. <coughs> we calculated our row value for the purposes of design. Using that row value, we determined what the required uh, section properties of the beam were. That's where that 57, 26 inches cubed came in. That you remember BD squared. It's kind of like a section module. It's not the exact same, but it's kind of like that for the purposes of design. From BD squared and our assumed D over B ratio, we were able to determine the required width of the beam. So from that, we could come out with a beam size. Based on that beam size and our row value, we could select uh, reinforcement. And remember, we selected reinforcement based on you know, our smallest area of steel, but it wasn't just that. We had to make sure that whatever beam we selected, that the contractor could, could put that thing together. So over here on the, uh, the middle column was our, you know, trial reinforcement patterns, but on the right was the minimum beam width required to even place that rebar. So what we found is that this bottom one, the three number tens, would actually be the most efficient design, and we could actually construct it because we need 10.4 inches of room. Yes, sir? Well, okay, that's a good... 
It's a good question, and it's a loaded question because it goes into money, it goes into availability, what, what's going to lead to your less lead time. It also goes into what you're ordering for the rest of the project. I mean, if you're ordering a bunch of number eights for the entire project, then you might as well just order a few more. You know, that might make more sense. It's, it's a loaded question. So uh, it's a great question, but there's no simple answer. The, uh, the answer, engineering. That's what <laughs> So, all right, so where we left off was this, okay? So this is our trial design, a beam that is 14 inches wide by 24 inches tall. The beam, uh, uh, the rebar for the beam is placed 21 inches from the top of the beam. Uh, the area of steel, we're using three number 10 bars, so an area of steel of 3.79 square inches. Okay, everybody good? So now what we need to do is we need to take this beam and we need to analyze it, okay? So step nine, analyze trial section. Okay, so we made two assumptions right off the bat. One of those assumptions was estimating how heavy the beam was going to be, right? Now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to recalculate the beam self-weight. So we'll start off with beam self-weight. So how do we calculate the self-weight of the beam? We take the unit weight of concrete and multiply it times what? Area, so B times H. So that is 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot times 14 inches, times 24 inches. Anybody got a problem with that? If I just put equals. There, there we go, units. We have to recognize that we've got inches here. And one square foot, or not cubic foot, square foot, is equal to 144 square inches. So, plug and chug, and that gives you 0 0.350 kips per, per foot. And I guess one thing I'll put right here is that's much heavier than we assumed. Okay, because if I remember correctly, we assumed a unit weight of, yeah, you know, we assumed about 0.142 based on our trial, our, our very beginning, the, the minimum height and the beam width. So we assumed 0.142, but it's actually all over twice that. So that's something worth mentioning right off the bat. Again, with experience, you'll get better. You'll get better with, with estimating beam weights. So, we have a self-weight of 0 0.350 kips per foot. Help me out. What's our dead load? Let's see if y'all remember. The superimposed dead load on top of that. One. And our live load. There we go. So, we have WU is 1.2. plus or times our dead plus 1.6 times our live load. So that's what 1.35. Plug and chug and that is about 4.82 kip per foot. And now what do I need to do? Change it to PSI? or what? This is a distributed load on this beam. What do I really need for purposes of checking my design? 
moment. So I need a moment that is what? How do I calculate moment? There we go. W L squared over A. So that is 4.82 kip per foot. I can do that a little better than that. How long does this beam again? 22 feet over 8, and that is. Excuse me. So what I'll say, and I'm going to just sort of write this off to the side again, MU 291.6 foot kips, that's a very critical value for us right now because that is the actual moment on our beam for, for our trial beam. That moment is calculated really with no assumptions. Okay. We've got a trial design that we are evaluating. We didn't assume anything to get to this. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. All right. Everybody good? Now, I want to. I want you all to drive this this car a little bit. Okay? So. What we just did is compute the factored load on this section. What do we now need? This is MU. What do we now need to compute? I mean, we are employing load and resistance factor design. So we've got the loads. What do we need? What's that? We need the resistance. We need MN. But we don't just need MN, do we? What do we really need? VMN. We need the design resistance. Okay, so let's start off with the simple one. Let's start off with MN. Okay, is everybody good over here on this page? All right. So we'll say nominal resistance. Now you all have a homework due on Wednesday where you need to compute nominal resistance. So you all should know by now how to do it, but we'll walk through it. So we compute nominal resistance based on equilibrium. So what does that mean for a concrete beam? It means that the compressive force must equal the tensile force, right? So help me out. Let's see if we remember this. We have a compressive force inside our beam, and we have a tensile force inside our beam. How do we calculate the tensile force inside our beam? Just in general. And somebody besides you. Mr. Hampton. Okay, all right. How do we calculate that? We, take, we assume that the steel yields. So, tell me what to write. Right. We take the area of steel and multiply it times what? Nope. Remember, we take the area times the stress to get our force, right? That's our compressive force inside the section. Or tensile force inside the section, sorry. Mr. Beals, what's our compressive force inside the section? No, 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 no. That's, that's steel design. <laughs> All right. M remember, hold on. We take our uniform stress. What stress do we assume that the concrete is experiencing? Mr. McCracken. All right, all right, all right. You say 0 0.85 FC prime times what? Y'all help me out. 
There we go. There we go. Remember, we have a concrete beam with some amount of steel reinforcement. We have a stress profile. The concrete we assume is experiencing uniform compression. The steel we assume is experiencing uniform tension. This is 0 0.85 FC prime acting over a depth A. Y'all y'all remember this? Everybody with me? Okay, all right, all right. So what must be true about these two forces? They must be equal, yes. Otherwise, the beam's running away from you. So 0 0.85 FC prime AB must be equal to ASFY. What am I doing? What am I solving for? Hey, that's the one thing I don't know. I know the dimensions of the beam. I know the material characteristics. I know the reinforcement. I don't know A. So A is calculated as AS... FY 0 0.85 FC prime B, which is 0 0.85 on the bottom. What is FC prime? Well, it's 4,000 PSI. Why don't I keep it simple and say it's 4 KSI? What's B? Keep in mind, we're evaluating our trial design. What is B for our trial design? 14 inches. On the top, we have what? We have AS. What is the area of steel? That's the area of steel for our trial section. Exactly right. 3.79. And what's FY? 60 KSI. There we go. All right. So plug and chug, and that will give you 4... 0.777 inches. Is everybody all right with this? I know it's Monday and I know it's kind of gray out and it's kind of raining. Everybody's like, uh, I'm tired. Staying up all night watching the Super Bowl. I don't really want to be in concrete design. I understand. But we're going to press on. Let me guess, the professor in steel design is just much better, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see if you all are paying attention again. How do we compute MN? Mr. Beals. Ah. Uh, we've done this one before. Nope. Nope. No. If you have a beam and I want to calculate nominal resistance, remember, remember this? We've had, you know, some force, you know, and we had that force acting about some moment arm Z, and we said it was the force times the distance, right? Y'all remember this? I'll get you started. It was ASFY times something. There we go, D minus A over 2. What's V? Based on what? An assumption. We, that's a good question. Though. Let, me, let me explore that a little bit. So you're asking why don't we compute MU over V? Okay. Even if we knew V, that would not be the correct approach. And, and here's why. Because when you're doing that, what you're computing is a required resistance. In other words, how much that beam needs to be able to withstand. That's not what we're computing here. What we're computing here is how much it actually can withstand. And that, that, we're, we're, we're checking our design. So I've got the beam. I need to use the physical characteristics of that beam to tell me how strong it is. Okay. So this isn't you know, what, res what forces or resistance is required, this is how much it can actually supply. Does that make sense? 
Now, does everybody remember this and understand this? It was in the last example we did. You're going to do this on your homework that's due on Wednesday. I, I hope you're going to do it on your homework that's due on Wednesday. <laughs> Do you understand, hold on, let me ask you this. Do you understand where this equation came from, how we derived this equation last time? Because if you don't understand that, problem five on the homework is, is really going to suck. The triangular beam, that one's really going to suck. What? You're probably going to want to watch the video. Remember, all this stuff's going online, so if you miss a lecture, watch it. So It was in the last example, example four. Yeah, no, 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 not how, how much it can actually supply. Does everybody get what we're computing and why we're computing it? That, this, is in, this is important. Does everybody understand what we're doing and why we're doing it? If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'm, I'm, I mean, you all have homework due on Wednesday where you got to do some of this, so if you don't understand, this is the time. Okay, all right. So, plug and chug. 3.79 inches squared. What's FY? There we go, 60 KSI. Our moment arm, what's D? 21 minus... 4.777 inches over 2. Now, if I plug and chug, or here, I'm going to erase this little force couple diagram. If I plug and chug, what are my units going to come out to be? Inch kips, right? It's a moment, okay? So if I plug and chug the numbers, I get 4232.2 inch kips. What do you think I ought to do with it? And how do I do it? How do I do that? Divide by 12. Not multiply, divide by 12. Okay? So that's 352.7 foot kips. Yes. That's how strong it is. But are we really after MN? What do we want? Well, that, that's from a design standpoint. We're analyzing our trial section. What do we do with MN in LRFD? We adjust it by what? What do we multiply MN by? Phi. We need phi MN. What's phi? No. It might be 0.9. It is based on the strain in the steel, right? Does everybody remember that? In steel design, you look up phi values. In reinforced concrete design, you must determine what they are. Well, that, that, that's a good question. Okay? That, you, you are correct, but that MN required was based on an assumed phi value and an assumed beam weight. Now our beam is heavier. So we have to go back and verify that. And the easiest way to do that is just to flat determine what phi is for this beam. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll get there. G give me a little bit. Now, let's go back to what we did before. We calculate phi based on the strain in the steel, right? Does everybody remember that? So we need to do our similar triangles. Is everybody remembering this? We did this last time. We had the 0 .003 over C. Everybody remember where I'm getting this? Okay, all right. All right. Let me start you all off. Okay, so that's nominal resistance. Okay, let's start off. Let's now calculate our strength reduction factor phi. Okay. All right. Okay. 
I'm going to start, start us off and I'm going to help guide you all in the right direction. The first thing that we need to do is compute our neutral axis depth, C. And we compute that by saying it's A divided by beta 1. Okay? Now that's, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll admit, that's, a, you know, that's probably a little confusing that you're, wanting, you're probably wanting to confuse this and this. That's not the same thing. That's usually why I, like, put these little, like, serifs on, on those letters. The C and T on the top, because it's not the same. It's not the same thing. This is our neutral axis depth, and we take A divided by beta 1. Y'all remember this? Because remember, here's our stress block, and there's our compressive force and our tensile force, but the neutral axis is a little lower. Remember, this dimension is A. This dimension is A divided by beta 1. Remember that? Everybody are okay? All right. So that's... 4.777 inches. What's beta 1? 0.85. It is a coincidence that it's 0.85 and it's the same thing as the 0.85 FC prime. It doesn't mean that's always the case. All right. That ends up being 5.620. All right. Everybody good? Now, remember how we use similar triangles to compute the strain in the steel? And we said that our strain in the steel was 0.003 D minus C over C. Do you all remember that? Example 4. Revisited, yes. Everybody remember that? Okay. So this is... 0 0.003, what is D? 21 inches minus 4.777 over 4.7, or no, 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 that's A. Yep, you're right, you're right. That is 5.620, and down here, the same thing. plug and chug, and that will give us a strain of 0 0.00821. Now, I know it's Monday. I know it's, it's early for some of you all. We're going to make sure that you all are understanding what's going on. Okay, number one. That strain value has to be higher than at least what all every time. Remember, we ca well, 0 .005 tells us what the fee value is. It has to be higher than what no, no, for any calculation we do. No. .004. Okay. Hold on. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow. Remember back before our uh, design and before we discussed economy, we looked at strain requirements in RC beams, and I said no matter what, strain has to be greater than 0 .004. So have we met that requirement or not? Yes. Okay. So what I'll say is this. Let me go back to full screen. So I'll say two things. The strain is greater than 0 0.004, so that's good, or in, we tend to say okay when we do these types of calcs. Okay, so that's a good thing. But I also make the observation that it's greater than 0 0.005. What does that observation tell me? There we go, phi is 0.9. So, to go back and answer what we were talking about before, 
is phi, what is the value of phi for reinforced concrete beams? It depends, okay? It depends. All right. Everybody good? All right. You may leave it up here for a little bit, or are you all good to move on? So, So, our design resistance, okay, what's MN for this beam? Was it 352.7? Well, you, you have it written down. What's V? 0.9. So, using these values, I can calculate phi mn, just multiplying the two, and that is 317.4. Now, to go back to what you were referring to before, this is phi mn. What is mu? Two ninety one point six. And I'll even put, I'll say, uh, from before or from beginning of step nine. Somebody take a look at these two numbers and tell me what this means. What does that mean? It means it's good, right? That's exactly right. Again, I, I want to make sure that we're understanding what we're doing. In the world of structural engineering, we're always looking at things on two sides of the coin. Okay? On the one end, we're looking at MU, how much load the beam is being subjected to. It is being subjected to about 292 foot kips. The VMN is its resistance how much it can withstand before it's going to break. I propose to you that this beam is a, safe, it is a safe design because it can withstand more than it's being subjected to. Does that make sense? Okay, so one final thing I will compute, and this is really simple, it's something on the side, I'm going to do our minimum steel requirement. If you remember, we still have this whole AS minimum is BWD over FY times the maximum of 3 square root of FC prime and 200 PSI. You all remember that, right? All right. Now, 3 square root of FC prime, if I do that over here on the side, how do, I, how do I calculate that? What do I do? Three times the square root of what? I'm calculating three square root of FC prime. How do I do that? No. There we go. You put in PSI, you get out PSI. So that equals 189.7. So which value here do I use? This one or the 200? The 200. So that equals what's BW? BW is just our beam width, which is 14. There we go. What's the depth? Okay, on the top I'll just put the 200 PSI, and what's FY? 
Do we use KSI or do we 60,000 PSI? I put this here, this PSI, to remind you that the units need to be consistent. Okay? So plug and chug, and that uh, gives you a value of 0 0.98 square inches. What does that mean? We got enough steel because our actual area of steel is 3.79. That's greater than AS minimum, and that's okay. Everybody good? So, I'm going to do a little problem summary here on the bottom. Some important stuff to recognize. All right? Our, let, let's just sort of recap. Our VMN for this problem was 317.4 foot tips. Our MU was 291.6. And again, what does that mean? It's good. It's a good design. How do we determine whether or not it is an efficient design? How do we calculate efficiency? There we go. Our rough measure for efficiency is MU over VMN. And if we want, multiply it by 100%. And that gives us, if you calculate that out, that's 91.9%. Is that good? Good enough, you know. Good enough. Everybody good? All right. Now, the other final points to make is that our strain met ACI requirements because it was greater than or equal to 0 0.004. And that our area of steel was greater than the minimum. So, if you want a be-all end-all for this problem, here's your be-all end-all. We had a beam that was like this. These were three number 10s. This dimension was 21 inches. This dimension was 14 inches. This dimension was 24 inches. This diagram that I just drew just now, that's your final answer. In other words, what was the purpose of what we just did? We were trying to design the beam. We were trying to determine what were the required proportions of the beam to withstand that load. That's your final answer right there. All right. Now you all help me out. Did this make sense? I mean, help me out, because, I mean, some of this stuff you all are going to have to do on your homework assignment, which is due on Wednesday. You're not going to have to do a full-out beam design problem, but things like calculating MN, yeah, you are going to have to, and I got some interesting answers when I asked you all, so I want to see you all do well, so you tell me. Are you comfortable with what we're doing right now? You lost somewhere in between. 
I'm here to, to help you all out. I'm here to answer questions, so. What? Is there anybody that has looked at the homework that's due on Wednesday? Okay. Any, any questions? Okay. All right. If there are no questions, I want to at least discuss what we're going to do next. I recognize this was a very long example, and I mean it is what it is. Concrete design can be, you know, it can do that. The idea, though, is for you all to just understand this process from start to finish. I was probably pretty verbose and, and pretty lengthy in my calcs, but I wanted to make sure you all understood what we were doing and why we were doing it. Everybody good? What, what do you mean, the, the sizing of the beam? Yeah. Well, all right, I'll say this. Um, How much beam size is actually done in the real world? It depends on what you're doing. Um, one thing I'll say is what comes next is pretty important. What comes next is if you actually know what the cross-section looks like and all you need to do is select reinforcement. That is done pretty regularly because a lot of times you've got pre-made ready forms and all you need to do is figure out the amount of rebar that goes into it. That is very common. There is, there, there is also a lot of design programs that will do beam sizing for you and, and proportion your beam. That's true as well. But if you don't know how to verify that capacity and if you don't know how to check and see what, what that program is doing, then you shouldn't be running it. Okay? And the same thing is true for steel design or, or anything. Okay? What's that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's fine. But I, what I'm more about is that you all understand the, the concepts. If you don't understand the concepts, don't even open the program. And, and any one of your professors are probably saying the exa exact same thing to you. I mean, uh, if you've had a foundations class, I'm sure there are programs that will size foundations and do slope stability analysis and all of that. But if you don't know what you're doing, don't even open the program, right? Make sense? So to answer your question, I mean, the, the, the procedures and methods that we are using, by and large, in the grand scheme of things, are pretty simple. So something worth mentioning. All right. Is everybody good? All right. Let me see where I was. Okay, so I want to discuss this really quickly. The, the example, let me say this. What we did just now was complete a design example on a beam where we didn't know anything from start to finish, okay, at all. And that problem is a little more intense than what comes next, which is designing for a known cross-section. In other words, you know the shape and size of the beam. You know how wide the beam is. You know how tall the beam is. What you need to do is then select the reinforcement. And that type of uh, design problem engineers face all the time. I mean, uh, especially in the world of precast and pre-stressed concrete. Because a lot of times when you're doing that, you're using pre-made, you know, uh, cookie cutter beam cross sections. And then based on your span length and based on your loads, all you need to do is select the amount of reinforcement. So that is a very common uh, design problem that engineers face. So that, 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 this really is important. Plus, I would argue it's simpler, okay? Um, maybe maybe a, 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 a valid point worth mentioning is the problem we just did in the design philosophy that we employed, you know, all that step-by-step -step process, that's probably one of the more involved design procedures we're going to use all semester. I'd argue that from here on out, the design problems that we do actually get a little easier. So that was a tough one, I know. There was a lot going on. But I think it was valid because I wanted to explore everything from start to finish. This is a little easier. So with this, I present to you a different challenge. You know what the beam looks like, and all you need to do is um, select the amount of reinforcement. Reinforcement ratios are going to rear their ugly head again. The only difference is, instead of uh, picking some row design, some 0.18 FC prime over FY, we're actually able to compute it pretty easily. 
okay? And, and I'll explain why. If we, um, if we know what the cross-section looks like, we can actually just solve for rho in, in one shot. So if you recall, we, we rewrote our MN expression when we were looking at, at economy into something like this. Let me go back a few slides to kind of explain. So I rewrote MN to look like this so that we could look at these plots. Do you all remember that? Okay. Now, if you look at this expression, what's it a function of? It's a function of your material parameters, Fc prime and Fy, which you're most likely going to know at the very beginning of a problem. It's a function of B and D, which you know if you're designing for a known cross-section. The only thing you don't know is rho. It's, it is pretty simple. So let me go forward. Okay, so designing for a known cross-section. So I go back to this expression and I say, well, the one thing I don't know in this is rho. So why don't I solve for it? So if I look at this and I do a little bit of algebra rearranging a little bit, so multiply this out, bring everything over onto one side, take a look at this expression and I want you to pay attention to rho. What does that expression kind of look like to you? This right here. It looks like a quadratic equation, doesn't it? I have rho squared times a pile of junk plus rho times a pile of junk plus a pile of junks, kind of like ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, right? I just use the quadratic equation to solve for rho. Now when you do that, what ends up happening is you really only get one answer that yields a positive value. So it's actually pretty plug and chug. There's your plug and chug equation. That's just me taking this, doing the quadratic equation, and simplifying it out. So does everybody see that? That, that's, that should be simple, okay? That really should be compli or pretty straightforward. One other point to mention, when I'm doing problems like this, do I need to assume a beam weight? Do I need to assume a beam weight? I, can I don't need to assume it, I know what it's going to be because I can calculate it. Again, the purpose of this problem, I know what the beam cross-section looks like. I just need to pick the amount of reinforcement that goes into it. So no, I don't need to assume a beam weight. So that makes this problem even easier. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Because you're selecting a row value for design based on the concept that you don't know what the beam looks like. Okay? My point is we do know what the beam looks like. Yes, yes. That's a good that's a good question. Yes. All right. Is everybody good? So, here's my procedure for if you know what the the beam width and the beam depth is and all you need to find out is how much steel to put into it, the procedure is pretty straightforward. So watch this. We compute factored moments. Read this. If the cross section is known, the self weight of the beam does not need to be assumed. You can calculate it. Make sense? Assume, however, we do need to assume a fee value to compute an MN required. Based on that MN required, we compute what our required row is. Again, we're not assuming some value for design. We can just compute what we need to have. Based on that row, row BD will give us the amount of steel, and then we do the same thing. Choose a reinforcement pattern, analyze it to verify that fee value, and that we meet ASNIC. That's it. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? All right. We're going to do this problem next time. One thing I'll say, just as a heads up, so um, this is just for your, your benefit. Um, on Wednesday, you have homework to do. And I'm going to give you homework three. Okay? Homework three is going to be due on Monday, February 22nd. Okay? I'm just, just going to be honest with you. It's going to be a big homework, okay? Because it's going to have beam design, and then it's going to have our next topic, which is slab design, okay? Again, this is going to be a big homework. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's due on February 22nd. If you wait until midnight on February 21st to start this homework, you are going to have a painful night, okay? So please don't, don't wait until the last minute, okay? For those of you that haven't looked at this homework, I have a feeling I'm going to be a really popular guy tomorrow. So, <laughs> so. 
All right, is everybody good? All right. We'll see you all on Wednesday.